Okay, so I will start. Yes. Um, again, I'm very, very pleased. We're very, very pleased to have Professor Alan um, talking to us today. This is the second lecture uh, of, of her. Um, the first one was an introduction on studying ancient Chinese art. What are the issues there? And today she's going to talk about, well, how do we solve these issues? Uh, Professor Allen, as I said last time, needs no introduction. She's a, a major scholar in the field of early Chinese studies. Uh, she has trained many, many um, students who are now early career uh, scholars and, and professors. Uh, she is in charge editor of Early China and the Society for the Study of Early China as well. Many, many contributions, um, both in writing and, uh, as I said, with her own teaching. I won't say more, um, but um, you, you can find some information and some readings on our website. I will put the link in the chat in a second. And Professor Allen, I think it's all yours. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so last time uh, I talked about uh, the history of the study of, of early Chinese art. So as I mentioned last time too, this is uh, part of a project in which I've been uh, doing with Handing of Henan University on the history of motifs in Chinese art in the second millennium BC. And uh, essentially during the development of the early bronze culture. So, um, Okay. Uh, and uh, the question is, how do you interpret bronzes or, or art that um, is not, not representational came up? So I'm just starting with a few bronzes. Uh, so those of you who weren't here last time or aren't acquainted with the art uh, can just see what I'm talking about. So here's a Tautia motif. Uh, you see the eyes there, the mouth, the horns, the split body, uh, and you see some little creatures above. So the question, of, the problem with this is that it doesn't seem, it, it varies so much that it can't really represent anything. So you see here, it's got these, this is a Tautia, as that was, you've got the eyes, but here's the, the horns have turned into another creature, that the, the face itself is dissolved, Got another kinds of faces here and and um, creatures here, so it's like a cacophony of things, and everything changes from one uh, vessel to another, so that you can't really interpret it. So we're talking about the late Shang, the Inshu period, uh, on these bronzes. These were the first to be discovered, so there's where the theory started to um, the theory started to be formulated, or ideas started to be formulated. Uh, so. And, and here you see that this, this wing is also a snake. So one thing can be another thing. Uh, and that's part of the obviously deliberate. They're not trying to depict something. So um, when we had the problem of meaning conference that I talked about in those arguments was before really the advent of, the, of, of co cognitive archeology. span And that was probably around 1990. And, um, in the 90s, then people start, in, in my book, The Shape of the Turtle, I pointed out that uh, in, in some ways, Chinese, this, this early Chinese art was like other kinds of what is commonly called primitive art, um, or which I called, like preferred to call mythic art. In other words, arts of people who, who are not drawing their art forms uh, from uh, text. Uh, though they may have literacy as, the, as they did in the Inchi period. So um, since that time, cognitive sciences in general have become uh, mainstream and made very, some very important advances. And so they're, they're, they're one of the ways that one could start to think about uh, Chinese art too. As, this is a statement from Colin Renfrew that I think is very useful in terms of thinking about uh, Chinese bronze art. Uh, the most coherent insights into the belief systems of the past must come if we exclude from the discussion the, form, the information available from written texts uh, from analysis of symbolic systems. If such systems are coherent, nonverbal language is employed in such a way that someone familiar with the conventions can understand the significance of the symbols. That is what they signify. I don't really like the term symbols. I'm so 
I like his i.e. what they signify. And nor need it follow that the symbols which we seek to understand are directly representational in the figurative sense. It is not necessary that we recognize human beings or deities or forms which depict entities already known to us from the world of nature. Uh, operation here in some coherent system consistently used. So um, this is exactly the situation that you have in, in China, and it may well have been that's what he had in mind if he wasn't actually saying so. Um, okay, so the problem of the interpretation uh, of, of uh, this Chinese art in general from this early period is that the contact, or particularly from the Inchi period, with which we're start, going to start, we were started by talking about, is that the context in which the motifs are found suggests that they should have a religious meaning. In other words, those artifacts that are decorated in China are found in tombs or on, and the, or are artifacts that were used in ritual sacrifices, ritual offerings. Um, so then you would think, well, this is a religious context. They're not found in, for example, ash pits. Uh, the, the, the context in which you would expect them to have a religious meaning, but they do not have a, anything representational that would suggest that they're representing particular gods or something like that, that you could transfer, make a direct transference between the artifact and uh, the meaning, uh, the, the, uh, the religion. So they're not particular figures, uh, so, but we do have contemporaneous writing, oracle inscriptions. The problem with that is that it does not provide any direct information that can be related to the motifs. So you don't see any names in the oracle bone inscription. So there's such and such a God. And you say, look at that. You look at the bronze and say, aha, maybe that's that God. Maybe it's that God. Um, in fact, the oracle bone inscriptions are mainly about ancestor worship. They also have nature spirits, which are named by things like rivers, mountains, things like that. But they don't, you don't really know uh, what, what, if any, other uh, visual representation they may have. The art itself is entirely zoomorphic and it, with, with, an, with humans added in. Uh, however, the oracle bone inscriptions do provide us with direct information about ritual practices, as well as indirect information about the structure of religious thought. So we do know a lot about uh, late Shang religion from the oracle bone inscriptions, from the tombs, what's found in the tombs, uh, from bronze inscriptions that show us that you have lineage um, cemeteries and so um, what kinds of things are in the tomb. So essentially you can see that uh, the basic religious form is one in which you have uh, ancestor worship. That is to say that the ancestors continue to live after death uh, and to need things from people and to exercise power over those people. Not all ancestor worship may work like that, but that's the way it worked in China. There are also potentially nature spirits uh, that are called things like river and mountain, and you don't know whether they have an anthropomorphic form or not. Now, okay, so what kinds of evidence do you have uh, when you want to think about what these things might mean. So first of all, there are things that all humans have in common. So this is where you get the cognitive sciences coming in. In other words, there are such things as neuro, there are neurobiologically determined aspects of perception, metaphoric thinking. Uh, an important aspect of this though, I think is to remember that the cognitive sciences can tell you what everybody has in common, but it thinks those things are still going to be culturally determined. Uh, so for example, um, dualism is something that, that is, is um, cognitively universal. On the other hand, the form of dualism, uh, whether that dualism is understood as uh, harmonious or whether it's understood as uh, conflicting 
is something that that depends uh, upon the culture or perhaps within the culture in, in the particular circumstances. Uh, nevertheless, uh, these thinking about what people have hold in common in terms of the way that they think is very useful in trying to imagine what things could be in a culture for which you don't have any writing. Then there are things that are specific to the culture. So this is the belief system. Ideas about the spirit world and life after death, ritual practices, <clears throat> those can be, if you have writing, those are helpful for that, like oracle bone inscriptions, but also um, you can tell from archeology span many things about what the belief system is by the way that they bury their dead, uh, by whether they, put all everything into the burial or what they build uh, elaborate temples, churches. Um, archaeology can tell you quite a, <clears throat> a good deal about the belief system uh, in terms of, of material culture. And then, and then there's information that you get from the motif itself. So if you have, a, and that's what <clears throat> I'm particularly concerned with. So what type of artifact does that motif occur on? It does it occur, so I mentioned that the bronzes, um, the context of the bronzes suggests that uh, they're religious artifacts. And you can tell, uh, for example, um, whether something appears in a tomb uh, or whether something is in the trash, whether it's buried in a pit or whether it's found in a house. All of these things can help you to understand what kind of thing this might be. Uh, what kinds of things can have this type of motif. And of course, the type of motif itself um, helps. Uh, then there are the internal relationships of the elements within the motif. And of course, in, in, the, in Shang art, this is very important, late <clears throat> Shang period, you say, what, you've got certain kinds of motifs, but they, you can break it down to the element into, <coughs> elements and you can say, well, what are the relationships between these elements? What can occur with what normally occurs with what else? So you, I, I tend to use, look at context and structure. Um, and then there's also the history of mo the motif. So where did this motif come from? And uh, uh, where is it going? I, I tend to <laughs> stick mainly to where it came from, uh, but uh, the history of motif uh, will show you how it changed and, and, and what give you a better idea of what's specific about what it is that you're seeing. Okay, so let's take an example. And this is the, we, we saw the Tautia motif and I pointed out that it has eyes. Uh, the Tautia motif in, includes animal and human parts. And, and this is actually a major part of um, ancient Chinese artists that is actually all zoomorphic and human. You don't have any plants or landscape, um, anything like that. It's all to do with living uh, animals, including humans. Uh, the only consistent aspect of the Tautia is that it always has a pair of eyes. Uh, those eyes may be, and I say always, always historically from the, from the first Time it appears as a motif on bronzes, um, and also in all iterations of it. But these eyes take two forms, which are animal and human. So um, you have obviously some kind of dualism going on here. So these are two examples, or I mean, are, are examples of the two forms of eyes uh, in their first appearances on bronzes in the early Shang period. Uh, so you see the, the example at the top is from a jue. Um, this is a wine pourer. And it's, um, this is actually the front of it. It's a band of ornament. And here is, is the handle. So these, this rubbing makes it look like they're all straight, but they're not. This is two sides of the vessel. And on this side, you have these oblong eyes. And on this side, you have human-shaped eyes. They're, they're round and they have 
white sclera on both sides. They show the sclera on both sides. And that sclera on both sides, which I'll discuss a little bit more, is what defines uh, them as human eyes. And then the most taught here, they have one or the other. It's unusual to have two types of eyes on the same vessel. But the fact that this very early vessel had both forms of eyes on it is, I think, significant. Um, the, and here you have another, uh, other examples of, of, of here animal eyes, oblong eyes, and here human eyes, and the same one here and here. Now, oblong eyes are significant, and uh, that's what I'm going to talk about now. Okay, the first what we have at the top here is a human eye, and human eyes are unique in having white that you see on both sides of the pupil. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about why that is and what its evolutionary value was in a moment. But when you read the early descriptions of, of, of the Tautia, um, and it, it's usually said that they have canti on both sides. Canti are these points. A lot of animal eyes have points on both sides, even like the sheep here has points, but no other animal has white on both sides. Uh, and this is the eye that you see in the Petronius character for Mu, which in our Kabon inscriptions is like this. So you've got this round iris with a round pupil in it. Uh, and ruminants, have oblong eyes. So the iris is elongated and they have horizontal pupils and the white normally or sclera isn't, isn't normally visible. Sclera isn't always white. It, in, in some animals it's, it's uh, colored, but um, you might, if it's white, you, you might occasionally be able to see it, but you, if you can see it, you'll see it on one side because the eye is turned. It's not on both sides. Uh, and the reason they have these kinds of horizontal pupils is because they are ruminants. That is to say that when they're grazing, they have their head down and that allows them to, if there's a predator coming, that allows them to, to have a larger range of vision. So it includes animals that are not so directly related like cows and sheep and, and deer and horses also have the same kind of eye. Horses have especially elongated eyes. But uh, other kinds of animals have round irises and various types of pupils, like cats have um, vertical pupils, uh, snakes, and they, there are birds here. Now, the point I'm making is that the tail chair actually only has human and ruminant eyes. It doesn't have round eyes ever. Uh, this is uh, a late Shang bronze, one once we saw before were early Shang bronzes. And in the late Shang bronze, they show the uh, pupils here. So they show them as horizontal and, and, and round pupil here. But the important thing is that they show horizontal pupils here. So you can see that it's not just my imagination that those elongated uh, eyes in the early period were actually those of, of, um, uh, of ruminants. But Chang bronzes do have uh, other round eyes shown. So birds, for example, this is a bird motif. It has round eyes here. Uh, this kind of dragon, it can have round eyes or long guided eyes or maybe even human eyes. So um, other creatures besides the Tautia on the bronzes can have this third type of eye or the kinds of eyes you find in the Tautia. So my point that I'm making here is that they that the Tautia is restricted to these two kinds of eyes is, uh, is significant. Okay, so what are the implications of this kind of morphology of human eyes? Um, <laughs> so here I've gone in <laughs> a lot of cognitive science. I got really interested in it, although it's not all 
so directly relevant. But one of the things is that uh, you, communi you communicate with your eyes by the fact that you have white sclera on both sides of the pupil. So what is being, and our faces are also frontal and which also allows the communication. And we, we look at one another directly in the eyes, which animals don't do. So what has been speculated is that people first communicated with their eyes before they, before they began to speak, that this was an earlier form of communication uh, than, than any of the others in, in, in human evolution. In any case, it's something that's unique. Um, and in other kinds of animals, it, the, the, the zoological speculation is it's actually dangerous, would actually be dangerous. People, they don't, animals will not normally directly look at one another except as an aggressive move. Uh, so if they look directly at one another, that's a sign of aggression. Otherwise, they, you'll see they, they, they'll turn their head. And the other thing is that with our kind of eyes, uh, we can still see turning our head uh, and just turn our head, whereas other higher primates, they turn their whole bodies one way or the other in order to uh, see things. Now, this communication with the eyes is, is very uh, closely related to the fact that we have an orientation towards eyes and faces. And this comes from very early infancy, that uh, infants uh, very quickly learn to recognize eyes and faces uh, and to look at their, their mothers. Uh, in fact, so this orientation and also when we look at eyes, we actually have a chemical reaction. Uh, in terms of uh, how the, our, our physiology. To see somebody in the eyes has an actual physiological, re requires an actual physiological response. Um, moreover, two blobs will be read as eyes in this, uh, and one of the ways that that's understood is by if you show an infant a picture that's just got two blobs, their eyes will immediately go to it. This is presumably why uh, the response that people will, uh, as I mentioned last time, Bagley said, "Well, these eye, these these round things, eyes on the on the on the Tautier or just to focus your vision. Well, in fact, they do focus your vision and there's a physiological reason for that uh, because you do see any two round things as eyes and even babies do it. And three blobs are also seen as a face. They've even done experiments in which uh, you put eyes above, um, I was called an honest, <laughs> honesty cup where people are supposed to Pay for something as they go out of, out of, out, and if they they have a picture of two eyes above it, more people put their money in the box. So you 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 automatically think if something is seeing you, uh, you project, uh, even if it's not actually depicted, you project a presence. That is to say, eyes imply a face and a seer who has cognizance, and uh, in in the philosophical. Uh, literature, this comes into the idea of um, recognition of other people's minds, uh, it, that one automatically, uh, by this physiological use of one's eyes, you, you have you imagine another person who is seeing you and that person as having a mind. So we have this all kind of expressions like eyes or the window and the soul. Um, now another, so that's one aspect that could be part of the eyes and the talent. Yeah, another thing uh, that's been pointed out uh, or argued at least is that eye motifs and spiral patterns uh, in Neolithic art are referred to hypnagogic experiences. Now, hypnagogic experiences 
are things like anything from particularly vivid uh, visual impressions uh, at that point between wake and sleep, like when you just wake up, uh, to goes to whole spectrum to actual um, trance states in which you uh, see things uh, or uh, hallucinations. Uh, so it's a spectrum, and it's a spectrum that, according to David Lewis Williams and David Pierce, everyone is on. So in this sense, uh, people that are shamans are people who have a particularly readily or particularly easy, good ability to enter into uh, a state of trance. But everyone uh, has some ability to do this. You just, they're just specialists in it. And everyone has these same kinds of visions. Uh, because of, for physiological reasons. Now, the other point here is that alcohol and music are used cross-culturally to induce hypnagogic experiences, music and dancing, one should say. Um, it's amazing uh, how much alcohol they've discovered now all over the world, how early it was produced. I mean, people were drinking very, very early on. In China is probably the earliest example of alcohol use that's been found, which is Jahu, at Jahu around 7,000 BC. But there are um, these amphora-like Neolithic vessels. Um, they come, they've, they've got a sharp point at the end. And when I was a student, uh, we learned they were for water, like in, in Yangsha pottery. You know, thing, uh, so, um, and now that they've done chemical analysis of the of the the pottery they've discovered they were actually for steeping wine and whether you want to say wine or beer is contested uh the the alcohol in, in early china uh was uh grain produced millet or or wheat or whatever but but it also had had mixtures of uh, fruit in it, like berries and things like that in it, and also herbs. Uh, so it, it, there would be steeping the herbs, whatever, into in these, in this alcohol as it, as it fermented, uh, in these kinds of vessels. In the Shang Dynasty, wine vessels were at the core of the ritual set, and I think that that's also particular particularly significant. So the jue and gu that were the first vessels that were cast in bronze and are the vessels that are core to all Shang ritual sets, but not zhou. And I think that's also significant. Um, that, so th those were the, what they first produced in bronze and they remain the core. And not only that, uh, so, and, um, and, the um, musical, they were also had musical instruments, bells, ocarinas, chimes, and drums. And these actually also can have the Tatiya motif on them. So that the I motif might have something to do with um, visions that people had um, is not at all far-fetched. And it's also important that it would not necessarily refer to shamans, the shamanic activity. So then the other thing that one looks at is the context of the motif, the Tautia motif itself. So um, In terms of the eyes, what I want to conclude with is I don't think these two things are mutually exclusive, uh, that the eyes suggest someone else that is there, that the eyes uh, suggest visions. So these can, the, the, the vessel itself is something then that has been used to make offerings. So uh, the vessels used to make offerings, you put the things in them and you're giving them to ancestral spirits. Then you can look at well, what else is what else is 
got this kind of decoration on it. And that's also, uh, if you say it's, it's to transfer the, the, what's in the vessel, uh, then you say, what, what else is there? And um, so there are bronze vessels, pottery vessels, uh, musical instruments, ritual weaponry. So one of the things about these weapons, they always call them weapons, but in fact, they, they really aren't, uh, the ones that are decorated really weren't for battle. Uh, they were more likely to be used in, in sacrifice, like you've got axes, that, uh, things like that. that uh, but on the other hand, weapons and um, chariots are decorated with, with uh, bronze pieces that also have the Taltia too. So the re relationship between warfare then and sacrifice is an important one because humans were among the sacrifices. Um, eating and implements uh, also have Taltia on them, things like spoons and bone implements that were used for eating. Some, but not all, jades. Uh, so jade artifacts that had other ritual purposes do, do not have, uh, as a general rule, do not have Taltia on them. Um, then in any, any artifact, you want to say, well, what is the context of the artifact? Like I mentioned before, uh, it's, it's mortuary. Um, and there you say, well, what is, why is being mortuary significant? And here, um, I mean, in China, uh, tombs rather than temples were, were, the, were the main focus. That's where, or at least that's where people put things. That was where the wealth was spent. And it's the place where the person becomes an ancestral spirit. They're also found in, there's also sacrificial grounds and pits that were used to make offerings and also sacrificial grounds where they find you know, animals and, and sometimes the animals are in artifacts and whatever that indicate uh, that the spirits were being feasted after death. This also corresponds with the practices that you see in oracle Mon inscriptions, which were mainly about what sacrifices should be made to people who were already dead. Uh, and the same types of artifacts uh, are not found in ash pits or ordinary houses. Okay, let's look at the history of these two eye forms. Uh, and the earliest one is Liang Zhu. And so you've got this is a, a Liangzhu jade, a Zong, and um, it has it's made up of two figures in combination with one another. So you've got a feathered headdress. This is actually a schematization of feathered headdress, like a Native Americans wore. And then you've got human eyes, and a nose and a mouth. And then you've got another couple of eyes and another mouth here. So. Um, I see this as a combination of two creatures rather than um, a two-bodied creature. When this figure is shown in a simplified form, it has two forms of eyes. One has got these, has canty, and the other has these kind of these round eyes. Uh, see, th this bottom part here has got um, animal feet. So, uh, this is some sort of animal eye. And when that animal eye is shown in simplified forms, the, the, the eye is shown as round, just a round circle. In Shurja Hill, Hill culture, which is in the middle Yangtze Valley too, you also have uh, two eye forms. And again, you've got, this is a, two sides of the same object. It's got a human eye here and a round eye on the other side. Uh, that's the same thing. Uh, and these jade pieces here, this is the two sides. This has got uh, a round eyes and, and human eyes. And this one has uh, this kind of teeth, which are tiger teeth. And this has a, a more human-like face. So, Dual eye motifs have a long history in uh, ancient China, in particularly in the southern region, but um, 
not just in the southern region. Oops. So when we get to the early Bronze Age and you go to uh, the inter Arlito, so in Arlito culture is in the is uh, the culture that preceded the Shang, and it's um, considered by many archaeologists to be the Sha dynasty. I just call it <clears throat> early toe culture because I'm trying to, I try to avoid using uh, historical names um, before they're, um, before they can be confirmed by, by written evidence. So these are made, are the earliest bronze artifacts found at at Arlito, and they continued to be made at the same time as the bronze. They were uh, bronzes and um, they were decorated. In Arlito culture, the bronzes were too, bronze vessels were too simple to carry decoration. So you have two forms of eyes, round eyes and human eyes. This is another one here that has round eyes. Uh, so that tradition probably does go back to that earlier Neolithic tradition. And uh, it, two forms of eyes are also found in the Dadienza culture, and here you're. This is you're up in Inner Mongolia, so this two forms of eyes was not uh, just limit. Didn't just was not a specifically southern phenomenon. The, the Dadienza culture and Arlito have a very close relationship, but Arlito also had relationships with um, cultures that are south. Um, to its south. Uh, but again, these eyes are round and human. This now we're back to where we were before. So what this means is that you 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 have now in Arligang, uh, early Shang culture, you you have uh, with the first decorated bronzes, uh, you have two forms of eyes, but they're specifically human and ruminant, whereas the others are human and animal, one can say, a differentiated animal. Uh, we saw that already earlier. So what does that represent? Um, one of the things that, um, I guess I don't have a slide in about this, but one of the things that's important about the fact that these are ruminants is that Around 2000 BC, there was a change in the uh, in, in animal husbandry and in uh, agricultural production that resulted in many more sheep and cattle being uh, raised. And in fact, so both sheep and cattle were introduced uh, probably more than once into China, probably from, from the, um, the, through the Northwest, that Northwest corridor. But, um, and they, so they had a longer history than that, but there was a change in the practices. They even foddered, they even had enough agricultural uh, produce to fodder animals. Uh, and they could tell that they fodder them now because they can, they've analyzed their teeth and they can see that they, what they were eating just as they can also now tell what human beings were eating. So you, you have a change, uh, not only in the motif, but also a change in, in uh, the way that people are living that may not simply be a cultural one. Uh, the question comes is, well, what's being represented? by these humans and ruminants. The human eyes could be those of sacrificed humans. They could be religious interlocutors or shamans, spirits, or they could represent some spiritual aspect of humans. And the animal eyes some also could be sacrificed animals. So the sheep and uh, you have a uh, a progression. Uh, I think I have a slide about this later, but you have a progression of the change in the 
value attributed to certain animals in sacrifice that also shows up in the Arlito Arlegan period. So pigs were the first main animal used for food and the main animal used in sacrifice. Then um, sheep and then cattle uh, become more and more important, both in sacrifice, and you see this in oracle bone inscriptions too, the bones used for divination in the early toe period, they start the sheep, there might be more sheep than there are cattle. And then in, in Chung period, clearly cattle are considered better than sheep. And then turtles come in uh, and become quite significant as well. So this, I'm putting this here as a, more as a question and not something that I'm going to try to answer in this talk. Um, another aspect, though, the interesting aspect of this is, is from Zhengzhou from the early Shang period. So we say there are eyes uh, then, but we do get, and we have two kinds of animals. And here uh, on this pottery shard, you see this split human, like a split Tatia figure. And then it's got here, uh, snakes with human eyes and the human has these ruminant eyes. So what's being depicted by these kinds of eyes doesn't seem to be that this is that animal. It's some, I would tend to think it's more some aspect of that animal. Um, this then, in terms of the form, if you see this rather way that he had split, but notice that his hands are bent towards him. If he was crawling, that wouldn't be true. His hands would be out. So actually his, it's a split form. Uh, if you look at it like this, this is this, and then you see these jade figures. And then you have here, uh, this is at, at Qingan Da Yangzhou in the South. Uh, but at Yin Xu Fu Mu, you also have this same position, and just as this is a beak and, and, a, and a, a cock of some sort, uh, the, these are bird men too. Uh, so um, you have the bird mixture in with these, um, mixed into the, into the, the concept. Um, Oh, so this is I was this is the uh, slide I was thinking came earlier. Okay, uh, the horns of the Yin Shu period on the Tautia are also cattle, buffalo, sheep, goats, and deer. Um, and this starts these 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 horns begin to develop uh, earlier than that uh, in the early Shang period. But uh, this also confirms it, it corresponds to the kinds of eyes that are being shown. Um, and these are also animals that are used in sacrifice. And as I mentioned, uh, the sheep and cattle husbandry increased. And uh, I think I've all said all of this. So before I conclude, I wanted to mention that there are other types of neurobiological evidence uh, that, that can be useful. Uh, and these other types also, if you use this, um, you, you will see that uh, when you think about these other types of neurobiological evidence, in fact, all of the animals that are found in this art uh, are actually related uh, in one way or another to, to, to what we know. So there are some animals that evoke uh, biochemical reactions of what uh, Balaji Munkar has called uh, elementary fear. And he takes elementary fear as the basis of human re religiosity. Um, whether that's true or not, it's definitely true that when you look at oracle bone inscriptions, uh, the sense that you get is fear, that uh, they're trying to stave off disaster continually by giving these, by giving continually offering large numbers of animals, human sacrifices, um, asking about what disaster may 
be fulfilled. It's basically negative. It's basically to do with fear. So the animals that produce elementary fear, uh, as Munker also points out, are common in art motifs cross-culturally. And they, he, he doesn't point out, but they're also in early Chinese bronze, bronze art. So they tend to be reptiles, uh, snakes, um, and uh, large cats like tigers, lions, jaguars, um, and raptors. Uh, raptors are those kinds of birds that um, eat small animals. Uh, so they're, they're carnivorous uh, and they have hooked beaks. So you can see like there are things like eagles and hawks and vultures. Uh, all of the birds in Shang are, are not raptors, but raptors are quite common, uh, judging from the beak. Usually they're mixtures of animals um, in Shang art. And, um, and when you look at the other type of uh, evidence that you have in what may be called cognitive, that is metaphoric thinking. Uh, so um, the idea is that people tend to think in metaphors. Metaphors are not uh, purely literary. Uh, they are things, ways in which we think, and animals are a big part of that. Um, as Levi Strauss said before this theory was uh, mentioned that, uh, or thought of, was that uh, animals are good to think about. <laughs> And some animals uh, are, are what Mary Douglas called natural symbols and now would be called something like natural or primary metaphors. That is to say, some animals have particular characteristics that lend themselves easily to metaphoric thinking. That's the way I think of it. And therefore, you'll find in many cultures or, or all over the world, they're totally, and totally unrelated. They have very similar ideas associated with them. So cocks crow at dawn and they're often uh, associated with the sun or the rising of the sun. Owls hoot at night. Owls have a lot of peculiar characteristics. They, they hoot at night, they stand upright and they have frontal face so that their eyes are in front and very broad. Uh, so in that sense, they, they look almost human, uh, but their, their uh, nighttime activity is very significant. Deer uh, shed uh, their antlers and we grow, we grow them every year. Birds fly in the sky, uh, tigers and lions. So we talked about them in terms of elementary fear, but they, they eat people. Uh, they're almost the only animal uh, that eat people. There are a few others, but they're rather rare in, um, in the world. Snakes, besides being venomous, they burrow under the ground, they shed their skins and, and uh, uh, also, they have the way that they move um, it, it is what inspires this elementary sense of elementary fear. So snakes uh, are very important in, 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 in early Chinese art, but, but that's very, very common. Um, cicadas that are, again, important. They, they burrow for long periods and live briefly. Uh, then they shed their exoskeletons, and then they fly with these unusual wings. So. Um, these, as I said in the beginning, uh, we, you need to think about these more specifically in terms of a particular culture. That is to say that you can't, they have to make sense together within that culture and, and what is known about what that, the way they're used and, and thought about in that culture. Uh, on the other hand, um, the idea of natural symbols um, it can be translated into uh, things that, that lend themselves naturally to metaphoric thinking. And, and that can explain uh, many of these kinds of similarities. Okay, so uh, what I've tried to do is to give an idea of directions uh, and kinds of new evidence that we have in order that people may begin to rethink uh, the way this, the history of this uh, ancient art developed and what it might mean in, in its context.
Okay. We can have questions. Thank on. you. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, you're welcome to stop sharing the screen unless you want to keep it on for some reason. Um, so we can see everybody a bit bigger, but as you wish. Um, yeah, we have a good 20, 25 minutes for questions. Um, again, raise your hand, put it in the chat, and we'll be happy to take it from there um, if you prefer not to interact. Um, I do have some, so I can, while, while people kind of gather their thoughts, I can start as usual, taking advantage of my position as organizer. Um, I think my, I don't disagree with the, the argument. I, it's also the first time I think about these things, but I, I would be curious if you could talk about be more about that sort of tension that you highlighted yourself between saying these are so so if we look at these motifs from the point of view of cognitive science we realize you know there are certain ways in which it's just the, how the brain operates and, and how we see things how we um we as humans of course um analyze things and so it becomes metaphors that we find cross-culturally but at the same time, you're also saying, well, there's also some specificity to it. There's a, there's a sort of tension there. And I was also thinking when you were presenting the, the eyes as significant on some vessels, there were humans and, and the animals that were being sacrificed, you were saying perhaps these are the people actually doing the sacrifice and these are the animals being sacrificed, if I understood that correctly. If that is the case, how then would you contextualize the Tautier on eating implements, for example. Is it, again, it, on, the one, on the one hand, it seems to be specific and kind of telling you something about the object. On the other hand, one thing that always struck me about the Tautier is how universal it is, to the point that it is actually tempting to say, well, this is just an art motif. It doesn't quite have the, the meaning attached to like the context doesn't give add meaning to, to this element. Okay, back to the first question. Which yes, was... sorry, it was very long winded that there were two questions there, sorry, sorry. The, the first question was about the tension between the, um, yeah. uh, the cross-cultural usage and the, and the individual one, was that it? Yeah, the, the fact that I seem to, I, I understood and also when I read this material and I use cognitive science myself, is there always this tension between saying, oh, this is how humans operate, therefore we find it cross-culturally, but at the same time, each culture was different. Right, but so the, co so the, so the way, I mean, in some sense, this is true of everything. I mean, we're all humans and we all live in specific cultures. And the quest, the problem is how you, get the particular interpretation for the culture that you're dealing with, say, which is ancient China. So I think that it's the patterns uh, that give you that, the way that things react uh, to one another. And uh, you look at, so, okay, you can say there are eyes everywhere. But then you say, well, why do they have these two kinds of eyes? Not just eyes. Mm -hmm. And so that gives you a specificity, which is in fact still difficult to answer. <laughs> and I, I have an idea about it, but I, I don't want to try to, to um, uh, prove it at this point. Uh, but you, so, and you have, so like you have ruminants, which you may not have in other cultures. I mean, the ruminants have things about them that are the same. And you can think with them, but then you also have to look at, well, what were they doing there in China? Mm -hmm. uh, and that is that they were feeding them for sacrifice, feeding them up for sacrifice. And that they were, uh, using their bones for divination. In other words, they had a kind of particular role that you looked at. You can't get too specific though. I mean, you're not going to be able to answer all the questions. And so this comes to then, well, what, why did your other one about what they're doing on the vessels? 
the way I understand what they're doing on the vessels and what's happening is that they are suggesting uh, the transformation that happens at the time of death. And so they're suggesting what happened. So what they're doing is transforming the, 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 the sacrifices into something that's acceptable in the other world. That, so that, yeah. that this is in some ways, uh, there's another world out there. It's got the ancestors. We don't know what it is. So nothing is ever gonna be shown in a way that's understandable. One of the things they do is deliberately create a sense of mystery by mixing things up. Uh, and so eyes themselves create a, system, uh, 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 a sense of mystery. And then I noticed there was in the chat, I saw a minute ago, somebody said about tigers. Yes, a question about Yes, tigers. I was gonna ask. Okay, so tigers, and yeah, tigers is right. The tigers didn't normally eat people, but it did this reaction of physiological Fear is one that is still people still have. They're the strongest animal, and they can eat people. I mean, they most animals never eat people. So it is what is unique about animals. And in the Chinese tradition, uh, what you always have is um, what's said about tigers is they eat people. The, the, the later stories and whatever are. That, that's the thing about tigers, they eat people. And when they show in the oracle bones, what they show is their teeth. Uh, and the Taltia has tiger teeth. Uh, and they show humans and tiger mouths. So it's that a tiger or a jaguar or a lion mouth is very often cross-culturally a symbol of a passage, passage to the other world, which is Casey, so this is the difference between this kind of approach too and a kind of uh, anthropological theory approach, which is that, um, it, well, anthropological analogy will tell you what, give you more ideas about possibilities than you would otherwise have. So if you see in another culture, this happens, doesn't mean it's happening in China, but it, it gives you a sense of possibility that it, it could happen. Um, so, uh, I think that the tiger as a pass, as a symbol of the passage to the other world, which in China is death. Uh, I mean, but death in China is not just passage to the other, as passage to the other world also means becoming an ancestor. It's, I mean, when you die, you become an ancestor. You don't, you don't go to hell or heaven or something like that. What you do is become an ancestor. Uh, so it's that transformation, I think, that, that, that it's, all, it's all about is this transformation of, of, of death, which is also transformation of the other world. So then it's not being spelled out. In other words, it's not a code uh, that you can decipher. And I think that's one of the problems that with, with trying to understand what's going on. Uh, and I think uh, Renfrew's statement there sort of caught that well. Uh, yet it's alluding to things uh, that, and, and remember that, that writing was not used for anything but limited purposes, primarily divination. It may have had some other purposes like accounting, but. Um, we don't really have any evidence of other purposes. So writing was also part of this. Uh, so, but, but people didn't read stories and, and things like that. So their consciousness of it was probably, it, things were not spelled out. Um, you, so you, you have a grandfather, your grandfather becomes a, you know, an ancestral grandfather. And it's that thing of between becoming a, a, a grandfather and an ancestral grandfather that the um, focus is on. Yes, we have another comment in, in response to this. Um, and if I may, you're welcome to join the conversation directly. I don't know if you have a mic on the computer you're using. 
um, but it's saying excellent explanation. If humans were given um, were given under certain circumstances, for example, death, dominant characteristics, appearance of humans in tiger mouths would seem reasonable. So this seems to be um, the answer. I also see Mariana has a question. Uh, yes, my question is a bit more abstract and has more to do with uh, methods. So um, obviously there are a lot of different approaches to studying artifacts. You mentioned some of them last time, uh, like for example, reconstructing the evolution of them or trying to find some kind of topology and classification. Um, and there are more modern ones, for example, where objects are given some kind of agency and uh, described from the point of view of biography. And then when you were talking about your own research today, you were talking, I think, more about situating these objects into a cultural context and uh, human experience. Mm -hmm. So um, my question is, do you choose this approach because you think that other ones are not as relevant for your questions or for the topic and uh, just should not be used? Or is it a matter of personal preference and you think that even with the drawbacks that, for example, reconstruction evolution has, it still has its time and place? Yeah, this is an interesting question. I mean, to a certain extent, all of our research <laughs> has to do with our own personal tendencies to how, how we like to think about things. But I do actually have a, a quite a strong <laughs> feeling about this. That is to say that um, there's a, been a, a very strong tendency to deny um, that the reality of uh, to thought, uh, or not, maybe it's not to deny the reality of it, to deny the legitimacy of trying to reconstruct what ancient people were thinking. Uh, and particularly to deny the legitimacy of investigating uh, the art in this way. So since, 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 I mean, when I started out doing it, I thought this was natural until I got a lot of pushback. Um, and, um, then there was a change in the sort of general way that people think about um, ancient people. So it's, it's become more normal. Uh, so part of it is um, <laughs> that most of my research, uh, whether it be with text or whatever, is trying to reconstruct how, what I'm really interested in is how people think. So when you get to ancient China, you get to people who are so far away from you, and then you see both what's common to human, pe human beings and also what's culturally specific. And then you see, well, um, narrative is not necessarily the be all and end all of, of everything. Uh, it, there are other ways of constructing thought. And that interested me as just as a general, as a general problem. The, the other reason is that I, um, it's just so curious because it was so difficult to figure it out. <laughs> and then uh, I realized uh, in this case, uh, having written about this a number of years ago and not seeing much progress in the field at all, and people more or less abandoned it uh, to talk about economy, politics, political, you know, see these as ritual objects, but the ritual, the term ritual is essentially uh, it's, it's denuded, it doesn't have any reality. It's put into a political, economic, whatever sense uh, uh, by most archeologists working in China, which is fine. I mean, I can research what they wanna <laughs> research. I have nothing against that. It's just that um, one also has to see that these ideas were also important. And, and I think now it's also, we realize more and more um, that ideas really can drive society. I mean, and I, I think in, in, um, people are not as rational as 
archaeology, which is a materialist discipline, uh, tends to assume. Uh, so trying to think about what the religion was and why they were doing things is very important, I think. that um, it's And things that to me seemed really weird and, and, and impossible to understand, like human sacrifice. When I started studying, as you are, I don't think it's strange anymore. I can imagine whole swaths of the world today very readily turning to human sacrifice if they were in the ancient world. Um, I mean, we kill, we allow, you know, hundreds of thousands of people to die for whatever reason. Um, so um, thought systems are, are, I think, really, really important. And, and we need to recognize that, that, of, that of it. The other thing is, what I was starting to say a minute ago, is when I'd written about this thing, and when Hunding um, visited uh, Dartmouth, um, a few years ago, uh, and we started talking about things that I had done, worked on before, and he was working on now, I realized I still had a lot of ideas about it. And then when I started to research and I found, well, there's all this new evidence that nobody's actually looked at, which involves, uh, then I, I realized that one could recast this whole kind of the questions that I was asking before with all kinds of new evidence and new approaches, um, new kinds of studies. Like you now know really what the animals who were because they can do DNA studies and you know uh, whether they were domesticated, whether they were wild and, and what they were eating, all kinds of, uh, of information as well as the cognitive science. The problem with it is that um, there's too much information uh, and it's very easy to get off onto these tangents uh, because they're very interesting. So I've spent a lot of time reading about cognitive science in ways that are not particularly useful for, 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 for writing the book we're working on. And I think this is a problem that people have when they write their theses. It's, it's hard to um, focus yourself and not go on these tangents and, and learn about all these things and, and then um, it, it's not really going to change what you your conclusions. Um, <laughs> I don't know if that answers it. Yeah, I feel I feel that yeah, was thank a you. Bit of a, <laughs> um, we feel it closer to our heart. Let's say that <laughs> um, that that problem. Um, yeah, sorry, Mariana, you were saying something. No, I just said thank you. <laughs> okay. um, that when I started out, you know, you, you didn't have very much information. So uh, people, my generation, okay, it was a cultural revolution when I started out. So hardly anything was published in China. You could, did get archeological reports, but you could sort of keep up with them. Uh, yeah. And now yeah. there's just, you can't, so you could formulate things uh, in ways that were, general more easily than you can now. And now uh, it does require more specialization. Uh, and though I worked very broadly, but what I've done now is to go back to at least things that I worked on before. So I have a kind of background in them and then look at the new evidence. Um, Giancarlo, I see you turned on your video. Just to give you a face. No, oh, I say <laughs> fine. <laughs> I thought you may have had a question. Um, I think there's a question in the chat, Lilicia. Again, welcome. You're welcome to join us. Um, but the message says, "Thank you, Professor Allen, for your talk. Sorry if I missed anything during the lecture. But I'm very interested in metaphoric thinking. In the metaphoric thinking you mentioned in the end, could you please point to some scholarship for us to consult?" I believe you mentioned Douglas Hofstadter. Again, I may may I ask organizer to read my question as surrounding. Yes, sorry, that, that was just for me. So um, the question is just: Could you please point on a scholarship about the, the metaphor metaphoric thinking? Um, okay, so I my as far as my I 
first became interested in metaphoric thinking and, and wrote a book called the Way of Water and Spouts of Virtue that was talking about the use of metaphor in philosophy. Um, the, the other references I think I would need to, if you, if you send me an email, I can, I can send you, uh, but it's more, I've more picked up on these from different sources. Uh, most of the writing about metaphor is, is about metaphor thinking is about literature rather than about imagery. And so the question then becomes uh, how to transfer it uh, to images. So, so like, uh, I can't remember his name, but there's somebody who's hypothesized that there's something like a hundred primary metaphors uh, that are used cross-culturally. So that's based really on textual evidence. Uh, on the other hand, the fact if there are a hundred primary metaphors that, have, that, they, that occur in texts cross-culturally, they will, you can also normally expect them to, to, to appear in, in images. Uh, the main, who, who doesn't, the hypnagogic thinking, that was mainly Pierce, uh, David Pearson, Lewis Williams. Yeah, metaphors we live by, some um, modeling images. And so my, my book, Way of Water and, and Spouts of Virtue, was essentially based upon metaphors we live by. But yeah, applied, which is yeah, like philosophy, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's one of the seminal ones. I remember reading it too, and, and it kind of give, it gives you a, a sense of what the, the main idea is. And I'm sure there's so much more on, on the topic that I didn't keep up. Yeah, it's still, it's still very good. It still does give you yeah. this the general sense. That when I, and what I tried to do was then to take it uh, and try to use the idea of abstractions being based upon um, concrete metaphors. So that they make that, that point, but they never really developed it. Mm -hmm. uh, and also to think about how to think, think through it in another environment. So basically most of the early writing on metaphor is it's very English based, English language based, and, and therefore limit, limited. But, but the opportunity we have as sinologists is that you can use these kinds of theories and rethink them in terms of, of ch Chinese thought. And then that should broaden the whole, the, the whole scope of argument. But it is very, very difficult to break out of the sinological ghetto, as I call it, <laughs> into <laughs> getting, getting your work um, read by people who are not interested in China. But on the other hand, I have to say that if you if you open a talk by by saying like referring metaphors really by um, in like it allows you to to attract their attention. At least that seems to be the case with with quite a few people when you start from things that they thought of, um, and suddenly you tell them, you know, this is this works for Chinese culture too. Um, it it can work. It's a, it's a way to establish that communication. I think. Perhaps we'll try to explore this too with, with methods. Are there any more questions? As I probably said already last time, um, you're welcome to reach out to us, to the speakers directly. Uh, one of the things that we also want to establish with, with this lecture series is um, communication between audience and, and speakers. So uh, Professor Owen just mentioned, send her an email, she'll reply um, with, with more readings or ask us and, and we will, certainly be on it. If there are no more questions, perhaps we can let uh, Professor Alan go and, and also all of you. If you if questions come up later, again, email us, reach out to us via Twitter, we'll, we'll uh, make sure to answer those too. So I want to very much thank Professor Alan for finding the time. I learned a lot, as usual, <laughs> with these talks, especially your talks. Um, and I thank everybody for coming. 
Will methods in Senate continue next semester? Yes, we will continue. There will be um, there will be announcements and things where we're thinking perhaps of having a, a bit of a different um, setting, but we will continue with more speakers. Yes. Giancarlo now has a final comment. I see a hand raised. Sorry, I didn't actually want. I was hesitating. I was hesitating. <laughs> um, well, now you're there. Well, I have many thanks for this very inspiring talk. Um, it has been very interesting again. Um, okay, the question I was hesitating about is, um, I guess human life is an, about an entanglement of ritual and what is lay, what is not ritual, all right? What is, what is we would maybe today call it um, a rational way to go through our everyday life and parts that are, that everybody spends on in a, in a ritual context, right? Um, I think it's very difficult to disentangle these two dimensions, uh, even today, actually, I, I think, I believe, I believe so. Um, would you say, um, well, I didn't, I, you know, I was hesitating because I didn't really articulate my question. Um, it appears to me that most of the evidence that we have from early China is in, in a ritualistic, in a ritual context, right? We have the, we have divination, which, and we have, we have um, uh, the bronze um, vessels and uh, objects, which appear to be in a, mainly in a ritualistic context, but it must be very difficult to guess. Um, If, if ritual covered more than it did today, I mean, did it cover? Yeah, I, well, I, I think you can actually see a, a pattern of development and that's why I, I'm stressed that I'm really talking about the Xiong period and earlier. That is to say, you can see that, that the whole Xiong state was driven by the demands of, of ritual, taking taking ritual as, as religious, I mean, in the sense that the fear of the spirits and, and um, making sacrifices to him, having to divine, I mean, all of their energies, uh, even warfare was getting people for sacrifice, uh, often at least. Uh, it was dominated by this, but you do get a change. That is to say, under the Joe, ritual become what we what we, things that were uh, ideologically or, or, or belief ideology is not really a very good term but um, there you you get a change in the role of bronzes and they're, they're to do with uh, the feudal system and the relationship between the king and and the ministers and then with confucius you get a, almost a kind of an enlightenment in which ritual becomes uh, is, is transformed into having an ethical dimension that it didn't have earlier. So um, it's not, um, I, I think there's a, there's a substantial difference between these very early societies or particularly societies that don't have a literary tradition, uh, which allows you to think in different ways, uh, but, but also kinds of organizations. Um, it, it, so I think it's palpable. I mean, you, you, you have the evidence, but it's not just to do with early China, it's specifically to do with this period before uh, the beginning of the Western Zhou. And in the Western Zhou, you get sets of bronzes made because they signify rank. And that's and and they're, they're mainly Gui and whatever. So you still have ancestral worship and whatever, but you and you have that all the way through China. So, but the sphere in which these 
of belief in things that you cannot understand. I mean, I don't like to use the term supernatural, but let's take it as a stand in uh, belief in the supernatural or belief because it's not really supernatural in China, but belief in, 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 in um, things beyond human understanding, the role that that plays changes. Uh, and having been brought up in a very rationalist uh, tradition myself, um, I, I used to think these things were all ancient, but you see it's, they're not. They're, they're still uh, very much part of, of, of people's, uh, what way people think, but it's not the same as it was when you didn't have any recourse to any other way of thinking. And that's the point that I wanted to make. When you're, when you're in a society in which it's all spirits out there and, and they can do this or that, and you don't have anybody saying anything else that allows you to think about it, and you don't have any writing that so you can see, well, this is, was written 100 years ago, and they thought something different than we think now. That gives you a kind of perspective. And, and they didn't have that yet. Um, many thanks. Yeah, many thanks. Okay. Thank you. Yes, for the last last moment question. So now we can officially close, unless there's something else that comes up. Um, but yeah, that was a, that was a, I, I agree so much with what you just said. Um, oh, we have a comment. Last, please. In the case of ancient astronomical investigation, it was all about understanding the beyond understanding. Yes, exactly. So that's exactly what Professor Alan was pointing at. So again, thank you everybody for coming, for your engagement, Professor Alan, for finding the time. Um, and we will see you next Thursday. There is one final talk uh, for our series and then we'll take it from there. Thank you again, Professor Alan. Thank you. Bye. Bye.